Thanks very much for everybody to be here tonight. It's really great to see such old friends, you know. It's, um, it is marvellous and uh, you all came along here and um, it's really wonderful to see you all. Thanks, Debbie, for those kind words, I think, maybe. Yeah, yeah thanks very much, Debbie, for those kind words. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you think the whole long thing looks a bit bloody weird around here. Well, um, you think the book must be a bit different. Well, you hit the nail on the head right there. Uh, but um, if you think, look at a pink, the pink and blue tractor there, well, the old man, you know, um, had pulled them apart and the, the, he was putting a new clutch in it, you know, so then he said, I'll give it a coat of paint when he finished. So he goes down, and there's this pink left over from the bathroom and some, some blue trim. And then, you know, mum says to him, Oh, you painted it? Yeah, yeah, pink and blue. Well, it's sort of tongue in cheek stuff, really, isn't it? You know, like the, the people in Caramere. You know, we'd look at it and say, Jimmy, your, um, your tractor's pink and blue, but they would never say the wrong thing. They'd say, oh, it's a nice shade of pink, Jim. You know? <laughs> they wouldn't run him down for it, getting down the road in his pink and blue. But when you looked at it, really, it wasn't that stupid because Noddy had a, a yellow and, he had a yellow car, wasn't it? With, uh, with red, red uh, mud guards. And uh, I always wondered about Noddy and big ears, really. There was no woman involved there, was it? But anyway, that's another story, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and of course the Morris there is um, not the original one because what happened was Maureen was at home having Debbie. Um, I, took, I went drinking like I did in those days and I had eight fence posts. It wasn't the eight fence posts, but it was a bloody strainer. <laughs> well, then I decided to wreck it, you know, and I wasn't a very bright young man those days and I, put, I was living in the state house and be, putting in the paper wrecking. Well, I didn't realise I had the only one in town. <laughs> so, it's not going to be very good for selling parts, was it, you know? <laughs> anyway, Bruce Delacar came in and I told him the story. must feel sorry for him. He gave me 50 bucks for the whole lot because I used to fit a 52 as well, so. But you can see why Debbie's so small because we made her in the back of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> When I first got that one, I came up the driveway and I'm always says, look at that little car just like we had to her sister Angela. Oh, Graham's driving it. I says, hop in the back and we'll tear one off. And she says, I wouldn't be doing that. I was quite pleased in the way, because imagine if you got cramp in the back and you'd never get out of the bloody thing, would you? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so then we got the Indian motorbike over here. Of course, um, the old man paid 25 pound for his one. I paid 14,000 for it and paid another 2,000 to wreck it. It looked like our one. <laughs> It was really mean, it was a, neg a second means of transport when he decided to go to Karamea to live on that farm. Well, anyway, so the last time I saw it, um, we, the Lears and I and the old man were going down the road and uh, we sold it to a guy called Billy Halfoot, and he was a legend in himself. And here's Billy staggering across the road and looked over there in the paddock and she's bogged right up to the uh, handlebars. And the old man stopped and Bill says, you didn't tell me you didn't have reverse. <laughs> so uh, that was, and, if, and the other part of, the, of course in here you see um, all the other memorability of that. Imagine if I told them I was going to do all that when I started, they would lock me up again, wouldn't they? You know, but anyway, I got out, I got to stay out. Anyway, you'll see on the wall there the suitcase that um, a lot of the stories come out of just around the corner there. It's a four star hotel, we're trying to keep things out, we don't want them too messy, you know. <laughs> and in that there, you'll see in that suitcase uh, where there's a telegram and any young one standing beside you, would you tell them what a telegram is for Christ's sake? <laughs> and uh, in that telegram it congratulates uh, mum and dad for having a boy. And of course, um, they were lucky to have me, weren't they? <laughs> so it was a telegram to congratulate on me being born that day in 1951. And down further is the book open on the day, on the, uh, 1951, the month that he was doing business. And the suitcase, as when you read the book, it just kept on and on and on and on. And every time we kept opening the suitcase, you got more and more and more stuff out of it. Um, <coughs> you see the shed parked out the front there. 
You can imagine, you know, I've got to get about $150 a book <laughs> to pay for all this shit that I put up, you know. I? <laughs> Someone said, when are you writing your next book? I said, when I'm saved up. <laughs> anyway, so the Chevy out the front is exactly the Chevy that we went to Karamea all those years ago from Nelson to Karamea. It was about a 12 hour journey those days. And um, that, there's a photo in the wall over there. Of course, the body of the chassis that we, of that body of the car that we went to, to Karamea in was a thousand times worse than this one out here. And of course, I'll just tell you the story of what happened there. When it gets out there, the body is that bad, it's fallen off, you know, because they're made of wood, those. They were Wentworth chefs. I think they were built here in Christchurch. And um, they, they bought the chassis of the Chevy and the, all that wood, imported it. And I think they had a factory around here somewhere where they bought it. Of course, ours is well past its use by date by the time the old Ram drives it to Karamea. And if you have a look in there, you, well, you, if anybody was, you'll see it in the book. But he gets out there, so the body falls off it. And, uh, well, it's that bad. He knocks it off and he builds one on the back. So we, he had some um, co corrugated aluminium in those days. They had it after the war because of the war. So he hammers it all out and he builds this cab on the back. She's wished I had a photo of it. Anyway, um, this particular day, he comes to pick us up from school. So you can imagine uh, he's got mum and dad in the front, um, grandma sitting on a um, kitchen chair tied to the bottom, my young uncle sitting there, and six bobby calves in a sack. And I remember it had no back on it because he hadn't finished it. So he pulls up at the school and the kids all come running out, you know, look at this like this. He says, bugger off, this is not a circus, you know. <laughs> I said in my book, well, no circus came to that town, so the closest thing they were going to see to a circus. <laughs> Anyway, I'll carry on here. Um, so um, when I was 15, I, I moved from, um, from the farm in Karamea with um, 30 cows and, and eight children. It sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, you, can't, you can't imagine why I didn't want to go back. <laughs> uh, I started work as, at the Bull Electric Powder as, as a, an apprentice electrician. Well, it didn't take me long to get a bunch of mates with worn out wrecks of cars, plenty of hot young girls, gallons of beer, <laughs> and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Um, to my wife uh, of more than 42 years, I found it, I find it, you find it hard to talk about love because um, I don't know the word love we understand or what it is. Lust is very easy to understand. But for Maury and I, it, it must be love. We, we don't like to be apart too long. We argue and laugh and cry together. We sleep in the same bed together, even though it isn't as active as it was in the past. <laughs> the main reason it's lasted, I've been bloody patient, you know. <laughs> but jokes, jokes aside, because we don't live in each other's pocket, nobody has the right in life to own you or control you. I can't, be, can't begin to describe the love and respect I have for Debbie, my workmate, best friend and daughter. Only trouble is she knows me so well. She knows what I'm thinking before I do. <laughs> to my son Ryan, it's a wonderful thing to have a son who I love dearly. We sometimes don't see eye to eye, but I don't think it's different from any other family. Ryan couldn't make it tonight as he's just bought the Lone Star restaurant in Nelson. And like any business, they need all their time, especially when you first go into them. Um, I want to thank Mike, Mike Bradstock. Put your hand up, Mike. Mike's over there. And um, of course, I wrote this for three years for myself. And I said to my old mate Hobbsy one day, I'm sort of going around in circles a bit. And he said, oh, he says, I was out in the booze one day. And he said, I met this guy, Bradstock. He, he says, you might. Uh, you might get all right with him. So uh, we went and went, met Mike and um, he says, uh, who's Jim Horncastle to you? And I says, he's my father. Well, then we were right because once you met my father, you'd never forget. <laughs> so he's the man from the University of Education and the boy from the bush. Uh, we've both learned a lot over the last two years, me most of all. I think one of the things was when, when Mike had written down my father and his peers, and I said, Mike, 
we eat pears. <laughs> and then he said, well, is it uh, your father and his mates? So I said, no. I said, back in those days, it was my father and his cobbers because we were trying to keep to the language of the time. So yes, you can imagine, we sat around and drank coffee and uh, laughed a lot over the time. And it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Mike. You've done a good job of what you did. <coughs> uh, thanks to Mike Winstanley, the man that put the book together. Um, when you see the book, it, it, it is fantastic. He done a marvellous job. And if you ever want any graphic work done, he is the man to go and see. When you write a book about what you learn about, hang on, when you write a book, what you learn about yourself and other people is amazing. Nobody can hide. As you spend so much time thinking and writing about it, you see everything as it is. My father has a big part in it, as he's a strong, one of the strong characters. People have said, why don't you write more about your mother? It was because saints are hard to write about, because they don't do anything wrong, and they're only there for other people, and never for themselves. Writing this story was hard for me. I had to go back through the book five times to be more forgiving of my father, and to realise he was alcoholic, and life had fallen apart for him in his lady, only in his later years. Now I understand alcoholism as a disease passed on through the generations. Two of my brothers and I have stayed well for a number of years, hoping to break the cycle for ourselves, our children, and generations to come. Some of my family are here tonight, so um, uh, who we got? We got Les. Les, you put your hand up wherever you are. He's in there, Les. That's my oldest brother. And then we've got um, Mary. Very proud of my sister Mary. She's the only one that done she done university uh, university training for home. She's a psychologist. One of the um, um, like the rest of us went to the Karami University. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, and then there's my sister uh, Suzanne. And I, I suppose you think I'm forgetting about you, Wally, because you were in the middle there somewhere, aren't you? And there's Wally, and then there's, there's Emily, other, endless other Billy lids down from them. So um, uh, their children and everybody else. So, okay, I, I wouldn't be able to keep going on from there. Um, people ask me, what were my achievements in life? And really, I suppose, um, I suppose I'm going to skite a bit now, but uh, life for me was against the odds wherever I went. First I had to survive my birth as my mother had 12 children with eight, eight babies surviving. Our, bring, our bringing up was reasonably tough. Then leaving school at 15 and uh, lacking in education and be, barely able to write a letter that somebody can understand. <laughs> Nothing's changed. <laughs> Marrying at 17, with Maureen only 16, and still to be married 14 years later, what's the odds on that? But, um, to go into business young, uneducated, and to make a success of it, the odds are about 80%. You don't make it in small business, you fail. To lose a child, the worst thing that can happen to any parent, to draw the blackest card of all. To beat alcoholism and depression, the odds are only 30% make it. Then live long enough to write a book about it. Of course, I had to realise all of this. And I may never have got started. Now I've written about it, I hopefully, hopefully having read about it, my children and grandchildren will learn from the past and not repeat the mistakes that my generation, the ones before, have. I want to share with you the event that changed my life forever the loss of our beloved daughter, Shelley. Whatever I've done in life before this, I had been able to control, but the one thing that I most wanted to control, I couldn't do anything about, take the cancer away, I couldn't handle it. My life crashed and I <coughs> descended into complete madness on the verge of losing my family and my business. My sanity had already gone. I went through five dry outs, three mental homes, eight lots of shock treatment, and thankfully an unsuccessful suicide attempt. I believe my life was finished. This book is a result of my journey back from the madness to recovery. There are so many people in this room to thank in these times. 
I won't mention names as it, I'd hate to miss somebody out, but you all know who you are. Those who know me well know that I have a hundred stories. I've tried to capture some of these in, in my book, but don't think that's all I've got. I'm not finished yet. Watch this space. <laughs> Standing up here, I cannot finish without talking about the rea reality of the situ situation we are here in today. Anybody get a drink? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Life changes in 40 seconds, forever. Our city has changed following the earthquake of the 22nd of February 2011 and will never be the same again. We know rebuilding can, cannot start as the aftershocks and the cleaning up keep going on. With the centre of the city still closed, shopping in the suburbs chaos, traffic jams everywhere, making driving around the city near impossible and frustrating. But we have been spoiled. What we thought was our safe little city, now we have to live with the inconvenience the same as in overcrowded European cities. The rebuild will go on for 10 to 20 years, well past my working life. For every person that ran in fright, there will be plenty to take their place in making Christchurch a better city than it was. So all of you here in this room that are counting your losses, just remember you're alive. And it's always darkest before the dawn. There will always be better times again in the future we will say goodbye, heartache and loss. And hello to good times. Thank you. Now just around the corner. Everybody has, has a story of that day. And the second last chapter of the book is ours. To date, as close as I could get before the, sorry, as close as I could get as when the book was printed, went to print. To all my friends and customers that chose to choose to read Horncastle's suitcase, I hope you find it a good read. In writing it, I came to understand myself, where I came from, where I am today, what I should do in the future. This book helps save my life.